Hello, welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be going through wide area network technologies. For all the previous chapters in HCIA.com, we have discussed several technologies, but we have mainly been talking about technologies generally as applied to networks. And when it came to the relevant layers, we've really discussed what you would call layer two technologies, but as applied to local area networks and maybe a little bit of metropolitan area networks. But what happens when our network is covering a long, a wide area? It's covering a geographically wide area, geographically large area. What happens? What is going to change of the stack we already know? What kinds of technologies do we need to be deployed? What does it even mean that technologies are covering a wide area? Well, globalization has a big part to play in this. So as economic globalization and digital transformation accelerate, enterprises will keep expanding their scales. More and more branches are located in different regions with each branch network being considered as its own local area network. The headquarters and branches need to cross geographical locations to communicate with each other. To better carry out services, an enterprise needs to connect these geographically dispersed branches through what we call a wide area network, or one. The development of wide area network technologies is accompanied by the, con by the continuously increased bandwidth. In the early stage, X25 provided only the bandwidth of 64 kilobits per second. Later on, the DDN and frame relay networks increased the bandwidth to about 2 megabits per second. Synchronous digital hierarchy SDH and asynchronous transfer mode ATM further increase the bandwidth to about 10 Gbps. Now, the current IP-based ones provide 10 Gbps or even higher bandwidth. In this chapter, we describe the development history of wide area network technologies, especially the implementations and configurations of point-to-point -point protocol, point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet. So Upon completion of this chapter, you will be able to understand the basic concepts and development history of wide area networks. You will also understand the implementation and configuration of both point-to-point -point protocol and point-to-point -point protocol carried over Ethernet. We'll also talk a little bit of NPLS and segment routing concepts and how they come into play. So I'm going to break down this chapter into four components. I'll start by covering the overview of LA wide area network technologies. That's going to be an independent video, which is the one we're looking at. The second one will be point-to-point -point protocol implementation and configuration, after which we shall look at the third part, which will be point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet implementation and configuration. And finally, we shall discuss multi-protocol level switching and segment routing. So let's get on with the first one. But before we look at the early one technologies, what exactly is a one? Well, a wide area network is a network that connects local area networks in different areas. A wide area network generally covers tens of kilometers to even thousands of kilometers. It can connect multiple regions, multiple cities, or even countries, and it can even provide long distance communication across several continents which forms an international remote network. So basically what we have for a wide area network is that we have local area networks in different places. This is for example, local area network one and this is local area network two, and we want to connect them. This network is probably in Uganda and this network is in China. We want to connect them together. So we are going to either lay our own cable all the way up to China, or use wireless, whatever infrastructure we choose to use, but it's our own, or we are going to get some company that already has a network between Uganda and China, between Kenya and Tanzania, for example, and then we pay that company that we are calling an ISP to lease us part of their bandwidth to give us connectivity between our local area office in Kenya and our local area office in Tanzania. 
So what are the differences between this network here, the local area network, and this network? What exactly are the differences? Well, for a local area network, we are basically talking about a computer network that covers a small geographical area. For a wide area network, the computer network is covering a wide area. Now, we normally do that by either leasing internet service providers network or building a private network. So in a typical local area network, we are normally going to have high bandwidth. These cables right here are going to be 1 Gbps or even 10 Gbps connectivity. There is going to be really, really high bandwidth. When we connect to the internet though, we are going to be paying for bandwidth somewhere here. And that's going to be now very little bandwidth compared to the bandwidth in our local area network. So a local area network provides high bandwidth but supports only a short transmission distance. If an it, for example, supports up to 100 meters if you want to be on the safe side. It cannot meet the long distance transmission requirements of a wide area network. Secondly, local area network devices are normally going to be switches, as you see. But the main network devices in the wide area network are going to be routers. We're going to see more of this as we go on. A local area network is going to belong to an institution, an organization, some company, some local government, something like that. While a wide area network is most cases going to be provided by an internet service provider. And some companies that feel like they want to do that on their own. Wide area networks and local area networks usually use different protocols or technologies. But this difference only happens at the data link layer so and the physical layer. So you remember we talked about the five-layered TCP IP stack where we have the application layer and the transport layer and the network layer and the data link layer and finally the physical layer. Well, these top three layers are going to be exactly the same whether we're speaking of a local area network or we are dealing with a wide area network. There is going to be no difference at all. Now, the bottom two layers are going to be different. Why? This is the layer that controls how we connect to the physical layer and the actual physical layer. They are made of protocols and standards. These are going to be different because clearly, the way you connect between a distance of 100 meters is not the same way you'll connect between a distance of 100 kilometers. It's not going to be the same way. So there are going to be a bit of a different set of rules, set of protocols that we deal with at the data link layer and different sets of standards that we deal with at the physical layer. The other layers, network layer, the transport layer, application layer are going to be much more the same thing. The private networks of things like banks and governments, military, and also large companies who are normally wide area networks that are physically isolated from the internet. Otherwise, if it's not those, the internet is just another type of wide area network. And small enterprises, even most medium-sized enterprises, are normally going to use the internet as their wide area network connection. Around here, they are going to be having the internet to provide wide area network connection services. But ideally, as we are illustrating here, the wide area network connection can be achieved using a leased internet service provider network, or it can be achieved using a self-built private network. So as I've mentioned, when you look at the technologies, for our five-layered TCP IP protocol stack, as indicated here, the first layer is the physical layer, the second layer is the data link layer, the third layer is the network layer, the fourth layer is the transport layer, and the fifth layer is the application layer. We've talked about several protocols at the application layer. We've talked about HTTP, FTP, Telnet. There's also DNS, SNMP. We talked about two protocols at the transport layer, TCP characterized by reliability and UDP characterized by speed required for real-time communication. We also talked about the network layer, IP, Internet Protocol, ICMP, and ARP. We've talked about all this stuff. In fact, 
We've talked about IEEE 802.3. We've talked about even Wi-Fi. We've talked about most of these things. Now, I want you to draw attention to the fact that when you look at the LAN technologies, for the first, for the topmost three layers, they are exactly the same protocols between the LAN technologies and the WAN technologies. They all share the exact same protocols for the top three layers. Now, when you come to layer two and layer one, the WAN protocols are generally taken over by IEEE standards, IEEE 802.3.4.5 and .11. But the WAN protocols have something different at the physical layer, and they have something different at the data link layer. So at the early stage, the common physical layer standard for wide area networks includes the common interface standards for Electronic Industry Alliance and Telecommunications Industry Association, uh, 232, uh, recommended standard 232, at the early stage. And then V24 and V25 formulated by International Telecommunications Commission, right there. And then G703 standards that relate to the physical and electrical features of various digital interfaces. Now, when it goes to the data link layer, right there, we have a list of protocols that are applicable for wide area networks. We have the high level data link control HDLC, we have PPP, we have frame relay, we have ATM, you know, so HDLC is a universal protocol running at the data link layer. This is a universal protocol running a data link layer where data packets are encapsulated into HDLC frames with a header and trailer overheads added onto the frame, just like in Ethernet. The HDLC frames are going to be translate, transmitted only over point-to-point -point synchronous links, whereas point-to-point -point protocol frames are going to be transmitted over both synchronous and asynchronous links. As such, point-to-point -point protocol is widely used because it provides user authentication and also supports both synchronous and asynchronous communication. It is also easy to extend. For example, we use point-to-point -point protocol and encapsulate point-to-point -point protocol frames uh, in Ethernet frames to form point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet. Now, we also have Frame Relay, which is an industry standard and switched data link protocol, which uses an error-free check mechanism to speed up data forwarding. And we also have the asynchronous transfer mode, which is a connection-oriented switching technology that is based on circuit switching and also packet switching. Actually, asynchronous transfer mode uses 53-byte ATM cells when it's transmitting information. So these are the most common protocols that we'll be dealing with in wide area network connections at the data link layer. At the physical layer, these are the standards we are dealing with. On land technologies, stuff is different, but the top three layers, the protocols are exactly the same that we deal with. Now, considering the difference in the protocols and the difference in the standards between LAN technologies and WAN technologies, I would like to introduce you to the device roles. They are going to be the same devices, routers, although we are mostly going to be dealing with routers in wide area network connections, as opposed to switches for local area network connections. But these routers are going to be having different roles. Some of them are going to be CE routers, others are going to be PE routers, others will simply be P. CE stands for customer age, PE stands for provider age, and P stands for provider. And as you can see in this illustration, a customer age device, we have customer one here, which is enterprise A, a customer age device is going to be the device located to the customer's premises. So basically what we have here is this is like our egress device. This is going to be like our egress device. Most of the things we have been discussing in all other videos are now the network connected this side, a switch connected right here, VLANs distributed right here, and this is the egress through which we are connecting to the internet. Now, the same structure is the same for each of these. We have our entire local area network, this side, internal network, this side, and connecting to the internet through this customer edge device. It is the device that connects 
to one or more provider edge devices for user access, user access to the wide area network. Now, a provider edge device, on the other hand, is a provider's device, an internet service provider's or wide area network service provider's device. It is a provider's important device at the edge of the provider's network. It is the one that connects the client edge device or customer edge device to the provider device or the provider core. Now, the provider device does not connect to any customer edge device. It only connects to provider edge devices at the edge of the provider. Client edge or customer edge are the devices at the edge of the customer. So basically, as I've mentioned, right here behind this router, we have the internal network of enterprise A. Right here behind this router, we have the internal network of enterprise B. Right there behind that router, we have the internal network of enterprise C. Right there behind that router, we have the internal network of enterprise D. This is going to be the egress device, the edge device, the device at the edge of the enterprise network. And this is the device at the edge of the service provider network. This one router here represents the entire core of the service provider's network. Now, it's not always just one router like this. We are just using this to illustrate different roles of the devices in a wide area network connection. Now, this is true, we're getting the roles, but we've also talked about several protocols. We've talked about point-to-point -point protocol. We've actually talked about point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet. We've talked about HDLC. We've talked about frame relay, right? And we have also talked about asynchronous transfer mode. Where exactly do all these protocols take role in this kind of structure? Well, when you look at the early wide area network uh, protocols, these protocols, this is how the distribution is. We have point-to-point -point protocol, high-level data link control, and frame relay applicable between normally the client edge device and the provider edge device. We are going to have PPP, HDLC, and frame relay working around here. PPP, HDLC, and frame relay working around here. Now, at the ISP backbone is where we're going to have asynchronous transfer mode. It is commonly used on the ISP backbone networks to support high-speed forwarding, extremely high-speed forwarding. Remember, there is a lot of forwarding right here. All the data from this client, all the data from this client, all the data from this client or customer and that client are all being moved around in this network. We need something that is completely, really high-speed to be the one moving the data at that point, and this is where ATM is going to be deployed. At some point, we also got to deploy uh, we also got to deploy uh, uh, MPLS at, at, at around that, that, that area, uh, segment routing around that area. We shall talk about those in subsequent videos. So that is the overview of early wide area network technologies. The technologies we are speaking of as early wide area network technologies, again, are point-to-point -point protocol, high-level data link control, and frame relay, and asynchronous transfer mode. They are the early wide area network technologies that we use for connecting remote branches. One local area network over this end wants to connect to another local area network over the other end. We are either going to build our own dedicated wide area network or we are going to use a provider's already existing wide area network to give us service to do the connection of our services. In the next video, I'll be talking about the implementation of point-to-point -point protocol on a wide area network and also basic configuration of the point-to-point -point protocol. This covers the overview of early wide area network technologies, which is the first of a series of four videos in which I cover wide area network principles or technologies. I hope this has been informative for you and I thank you for viewing.